Good evening, everybody. We've got, uh, I know we'll have some more people that will join us and we welcome you to uh, tonight's presentation. We're awfully excited to be here. Uh, my name is Kira Kwam. I work for Texas Parks and Wildlife and I teach our fishing program. And joining us today is our uh, angler education and many other jobs, uh, admin Heather England. And Good evening. I, I want to take a minute to uh, tell you a little bit about Pat Vanek, who's, who's agreed to join us tonight. Uh, Pat Vanek has been fly fishing for white bass in Texas rivers for over 30 years. Over these years, he's learned mostly the hard way by spending countless hours on the water how to successfully find and catch white bass on a fly. Currently, when not guiding, fishing, hunting, or tying flies, or unfortunately at his regular job, as many of us can uh, agree with, He's at home near Crawford with his wife and 14-year-old triplets. He is active in his local fly club, the Waco Fly Fishing Club, and served as the club's past treasurer and president for three years. He enjoys sharing his knowledge of fly fishing and tying with others and teaching this great sport on and off the water. He currently owns and operates his own guide service, Bosque Valley Fly Fishing, guiding fly fishers on the rivers of Central Texas and tying custom fly orders. We'd like to welcome you, Pat. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. All right, let me, uh, let me get this kind of set up here. Let me say too, that if you have any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. We, uh, Heather and I will be able to see them and at certain times we'll definitely be able to uh, ask your questions to Pat. Okay. All right. Can y'all uh, can y'all see the uh, the PowerPoint? Is that are we all good there? We're good there. Okay. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, as Kira said, my name is Pat Vanek, and. Um, I'm really happy that uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, asked me to uh, come uh, present this program uh, to y'all. I've presented uh, this program to quite a few fly clubs across the state of Texas in the past few years. And um, just a little bit more about myself. I, I have uh, I've been fishing for white bass uh, during the spring white, white bass run. Uh, probably over 30 years and, and seriously with a fly rod for uh, about 30 years. So uh, a lot of this uh, information that uh, you're going to hear, uh, I've just kind of picked up along the way. Um, a lot of it I have uh, learned by watching uh, other really good fly fishermen uh, here in the Central Texas area and, and uh, kind of picking their brains. And uh, they were, um, you know, nice enough to share their knowledge with me. So um, I kind of believe in paying that forward. So we're going to uh, hopefully help uh, a lot of you folks out um, uh, this evening and, and may, make you better uh, fly anglers uh, or just, you know, if you're co conventional fishing uh, as well with the spinning gear, uh, hopefully some of this will uh, help you uh, to find white bass and, and catch, those as well, uh, catch those on conventional gear as well. Um, if you have questions throughout the program, uh, again, go ahead and uh, type them in the box and Kira will, uh, will, will kind of take breaks uh, every once in a while. I'll ask for questions and Kira will relay some questions to me. But uh, other than that, we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Okay. Let's see. Okay, Kira, I have just forgotten how <laughs> to annotate. Well, no, not annotate. Uh, it won't. Uh, it won't uh, go down. It won't uh, change screens. Try just pushing your down arrow button on your computer, Pat. See if that'll do it. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It. Oh, there it is. I needed to click. Actually, click on the screen. Okay, you folks will have to forgive me. Uh, computers and I don't play well together. 
uh, I'm a lot better with uh, white bass than I am computers. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to talk about, again, up here at the top, we're going to talk about fly fishing, the Texas white bass run. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about white bass in Texas, the history of the fish and kind of how they uh, spread all over the state, actually, uh, their life cycle and their spawning uh, habits, uh, when to go uh, and, and try to find them when they're uh, running up the tributaries, uh, where to go, reading the water, uh, water levels, uh, and uh, a little bit about weather, and uh, of course, equipment, your rods, reels, lines, leaders, um, uh, techniques, and flies, and, and some other odds and ends. And of course, white bass fishing in Texas uh, during the spring run is very popular uh, with both fly fishermen and conventional gear. And so uh, when the word gets out, there can be a lot of folks in some of the, uh, uh, on some of the rivers and, and creeks that are uh, really producing white bass uh, at, at that particular time. So it can get a little crowded. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, white bass are pretty prolif prolific uh, fish. And so if you like to eat fish, uh, these are a, a good fish to eat. And we'll talk a little bit about one of my favorite recipes for white bass. So white bass, uh, that's their scientific name up there. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. I think it's Moroni uh, Chrysops. Uh, they are a true bass actually. Um, unlike a largemouth or a spotted bass or Guadalupe or a smallmouth bass, which are actually members of the sunfish family, white bass are actually members of the true bass family. They're a, a temperate bass. And in that group uh, are also striped bass or stripers, uh, hybrid uh, striped bass, which are a cross between uh, white bass and stripers, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, actually uh, grow, grow in uh, hatcheries. They don't, produce, they don't occur naturally, I should say. And uh, yellow bass, uh, which is kind of a, a lesser known species here in Texas. But uh, prior to 1932, they were only found in Caddo Lake up in far northeast Texas. And kind of if you think about white bass today, where they're found all across reservoirs, uh, all across the state, um, Caddo seems like a kind of an unlikely place with all the cypress and, and you know, Spanish moss and lily pads and, and, and whatnot, but you, you really don't uh, kind of associate uh, Caddo Lake with white bass, but uh, that's where they were originally found and, and native uh, in Texas. And so uh, the predecessor to Texas Parks and Wildlife um, way back uh, in the 30s, started taking fish from Caddo and introducing them all across the state and found out that they did really well in other reservoirs. And so, uh, you know, here we are today in 2021 and white bass are going strong all across the state. You can see the Texas state record there and I'm not sure if this is current or not, but it's five pounds, nine ounces. If it's more than that, well, yeah, that's a big fish. Uh, that fish was almost 21 inches long. Uh, these days, if you catch one that's probably, or you catch a fish that looks like a white bass that's 21 inches long, it's probably going to be a hybrid uh, or a striper. All right, so a little bit about their spawning habits when they uh, go up from the reservoirs in you know, regular deep water uh, habitat in, in, in early spring. To spawn, uh, they will uh, normally go up uh, when the when the water temps hit about fifty five to sixty degrees. Where they they'll start actually going up, uh, migrating up the tributaries of of major uh, reservoirs. Oh, I'm going to say probably in as early as late December in some areas of the state. Um, you know, and sometimes it, it they start going up maybe mid-February. But uh, typically the, the water temperature has to reach a specific, you know, temperature. And that's, again, that's around 55 to 60 degrees. Now, uh, of course, a couple of weeks ago in Texas, we had the Little Ice Age. And uh, I know uh, a lot of y'all were affected by that. And of course, it, it not only affected people across the state, it, it affected wildlife too. And I know, um, 
some of my home rivers here actually froze over. And then you had all of the snow melt and everything kind of dumping off into the rivers after that. So it cooled the rivers down quite a bit. So any fish that were thinking about spawning way back then or, or pushing up really got pushed back down uh, into some deeper holes and uh, waited for some of this recent warmer weather that uh, has occurred here in the last couple of weeks. But generally in Texas, February, late March um, is, is kind of the, the, the sweet spot. Uh, late February to late March is a sweet spot of uh, the white bass run in Texas. Again, that can depend with location um, and water temperature, water flow, uh, current, et cetera. So uh, there, there's a few variables that you have to watch to determine when the fish are going to actually come up. The males are typically the first ones to come upstream um, and they'll be followed by the females. And then they are, the males are generally the last to leave. And typically the last to leave are the young of the year fish. And these are the ones you're gonna start catching at the tail end of the run. You'll start catching a lot of fish that are about eight inches long. And uh, those are just young of the year males that are kind of hanging around, really not knowing what they're doing. Uh, their first year up, up the rivers and, and whatnot, but uh, they usually come out last. Uh, spawning white bass, if you're familiar with, uh, you know, how largemouth bass spawns or probably a better example or, you know, one of the many species of sunfish that we have in Texas. Uh, if you go to any creek, uh, river, or, you know, farm pond even, uh, late May, early June, you're going to see what looks like, uh, you know, shallow dished out areas cleared of vegetation that are scooped away by the, these fish that are on, on their spawning beds, uh, be it a sunfish or a largemouth bass. White bass don't spawn that way. They're, they are free spawners and they have to have current uh, in order uh, to have a viable spawn. Their eggs need to keep tumbling uh, in the current. So uh, that is why they, you know, that's the main reason they go up rivers is to find these, these shallow shoals, uh, riffles over, over gravel, rocky areas uh, where they can spawn and where the, the eggs can uh, move along and, and uh, tumble down in the current for about three days before they hatch. Uh, if you've ever seen white bass spawn, it's, uh, or if you've never seen white bass spawn, it's kind of a sight to see. They uh, get in schools uh, anywhere from three or four up to, I've seen as many as up to 50 fish pushing up against the bank or coming up in about two or three feet of water up to the surface. And it's, uh, it, it's much like if you've seen salmon spawning uh, in streams in Alaska, it, it's, it's, it's very much like that. Uh, a female will just start dropping eggs in the current over these uh, shallow gravel areas and the males fertilize and all of that, the fertilized eggs goes downstream and uh, that's it. They don't build nests, they don't protect their young. Um, so if they can't spawn, if there's not enough current uh, up the rivers, which I've rarely ever seen that, uh, in Texas over 30 years, there's generally always enough current for those fish to come up uh, different tributaries. You may have a lake or maybe in a part of the state where there are um, rivers just are not moving. And so, you know, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have times like that where some of the fish are gonna stay in the main lake and they're gonna actually spawn over, um, you know, rocks or uh, points or along rip wraps, along uh, dams uh, where there's a lot of chunk rock, uh, where there's enough wind action to create a somewhat of a current uh, to, to keep their eggs moving. But uh, when the eggs flow, uh, the, a two pound female, again, we mentioned that they were prolific a while ago, a two pound female can actually lay almost a million eggs. And so uh, that's, that's quite a bit. So that's, Again, part of the reason that they've done so well here uh, in Texas and really all across uh, the country, actually. They hatch in three days, uh, which is fairly quickly. 
and they will grow uh, about eight inches in the first year. So again, if you're catching white bass that are about eight inches long, um, those are those are year old fish. So we're going to talk a little bit about when to go, and you'll see this uh, up here. You're going going to see a uh, kind of a, a collage of pictures, and we'll we'll start here over here in the uh, upper left. I'm kind of moving my cursor around there. Um, basically, if you drive down to a spot, you know that is a classic white bass spot in your area. Uh, you know there's a parking lot or whatever that fills up when the, when the fish are there. Uh, it's really all you have to do is just go and look. If there are a lot of cars there or you see a lot of people in the river, generally that means they're having some, some bit of success. And so uh, again, you can kind of just drive by the, the, the well-known areas and whether there are cars there or not uh, in mid-March will usually tell you how the fishing's going. Uh, one way that uh, over here on the upper right, at least of my screen, you'll see I've got a picture of a couple of red bud trees. I know in central Texas that when the red buds bloom, white bass are probably at the peak of their spawn. They're really, uh, have really pushed up the river. The water temperatures have uh, hit, you know, that that really good range for the fish to be up there and spawn. And I've really never seen that miss. So, you know, one of the things is, is look for your red buds. I don't know how the cold or the freeze affected uh, the red buds. I know I did see a peach tree. Oh, I think late January, I saw a peach tree uh, here in Central Texas that was in full bloom. And I know that just got wiped out. Uh, the other way is of course, with the internet uh, these days and social media uh, as it is, uh, you're gonna you're gonna find a lot of different fishing forums like the Texas Kayak Fishermen and you know Texas Fishing Forum and, and whatnot. And so, uh, a lot of folks post on these uh, different internet forums, and when they're catching fish, they like to post their success. And that's kind of a double-edged sword, actually. Um, you tell somebody where you're catching fish at, and the next day there are 300 people there. So. Um, but uh, yeah, you can go on those forums and check. And like I said, uh, you, can, you can find out a lot of information about uh, uh, where the fish maybe are or uh, you know, what, uh, what stage of the spawn they're in. The last is just, uh, you know, if you go down to the river, and you don't see the cars and there's no red buds blooming or whatever, take a thermometer with you. Uh, the little one down there in the lower right hand corner by fish pond or some some other uh, little fly fishing thermometer drop it in the water for about five minutes and, and read it and see how cold or warm the water is and you know if it's hovering around the 50 degree mark maybe it needs to warm up just a little bit more uh, before they're really really uh, active right now um, fish are uh, pushing up in different rivers uh, across all across the state uh, there, uh, I know in Central Texas, there are no, by no means just really uh, in, in full-blown spawn mode yet, but uh, there are some fish that are, uh, that are starting to push up, so um, it, is, uh, it is getting going, and it, it may be a little bit late because of the, uh, because of the cold water and the cold weather, so that's, that's just something to kind of keep an eye on here in the next couple of weeks. So if you had to book a you know, a couple of weeks or, you know, if you're going to take some vacation to, to, you know, maybe hit the rivers hard. I would say the wheelhouse is probably those middle two weeks of March. Um, you know, they're uh, typically uh, year in, year out, you're going to have the best success. Uh, that's when your bigger females are up in the river uh, in creeks uh, spawning. Uh, so, you know, that, 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 mid-March uh, time frame is probably your best bet. Now, where to fish? All across the state, and I, I've just got a few fit, uh, few areas here. So this, this uh, we don't have enough time to get off in the weeds of, you know, access locations and, and whatnot. You can go to Texas Parks and Wildlife, or you can go online, like I said, to some of the other uh, uh, forums, uh, fishing forums across the state or uh, 
you know, Google, you know, white bass fishing in Texas, and you're going to find out a lot of information and, and probably some particulars as, as to where you can launch a kayak or, you know, if you have a, a boat where you can get upstream and, and launch a boat on some of these reservoirs. But uh, I just listed a few of them here uh, that, are, that are really good fisheries. Of course, uh, some of my home waters, the uh, <clears throat> Lake Waco tributaries, the Bosque Rivers, uh, the Brazos, uh, and the Nolan Rivers above Lake Whitney. Uh, in particular, the Nolan uh, has some foot access just outside of Blum. So that's a, that's a very good river as well. Uh, Brazos is a little bit harder. You have to have a boat to, to really get up in the skinny water. Uh, and it's a pretty good run actually from the farthest uh, ramp uh, on, on the northern side of uh, Lake Whitney. But the Navasota River just outside of Grosbeck, Texas uh, that flows into Lake Limestone has some really giant white bass. I'm not sure why those white bass are so much bigger than everywhere else, but those fish are nuclear. Uh, they uh, uh, just are giant, giant fish. Uh, as far as scenery goes, it may not be the, you know, some of the as pretty as some of the hill country rivers or rivers here in central Texas, uh, but uh, they do grow some really big fish over there. Probably one of the most famous, uh, I'd, I'd probably say in the top two, uh, we'll get to the other one here in a second. Uh, spring run white bass spots is the Colorado River at Colorado Bend State Park. Uh, it's a beautiful area, flows into Lake Buchanan. And uh, if you want to go camp there, you probably need to make reservations now for next year. Uh, it, it does get booked up during March uh, fairly quickly, uh, but uh, it's a very famous spot for uh, fishing the, for, for white bass during the spring run. San Gabriel above Lake Granger, uh, kind of just north of Austin there, uh, northeast Austin. Uh, the Lano above uh, Lake LBJ, and uh, we know that uh, had a um, horrific flood uh, a few years back. So uh, all, all, that, uh, all of that river bottom changed probably a good bit, uh, except for you know, some of those big granite boulders that were attached to the bedrock. But uh, a lot of things uh, got really washed around in that. But the Sabine River over in East Texas, again, another river. It's got some uh, pretty large white bass in it. And the other really, really famous spot that's been around forever um, is Rymer's Ranch on the Pernalis River, um, just outside of Austin, west of Austin, a bit there uh, near Bee Cave. Uh, another pretty river, uh, again, a uh, great place to fish if you've never been there to go. So there's just a few of the places uh, around Texas that you can actually fish for white bass. Any of the reservoirs that have major tributaries, and there are a lot up in the Dallas area, Ray Roberts and whatnot, um, Ray Hubbard, uh, any place that A, has a, you know, a fairly good reservoir, a fairly large reservoir with white bass in it and has, um, you know, some, some tributaries, either rivers or, or uh, creeks flowing into it, uh, are generally gonna have a spawn of, or a run of white bass moving up those uh, uh, tributaries to, to spawn. So uh, again, look for your larger core of engineer lakes uh, all across the state and just go to the, the, you know, the upper ends of them and start looking for uh, some of those tributaries coming in. And uh, you're probably gonna uh, find success if you start going up those. Uh, one quick thing is, you know, I have a lot of folks say, okay, well, where do you start? If you're going up these tributaries, um, you know, for the first time in a boat, I would say go until you start, A, kicking up mud with your motor, uh, or you start, you know, hitting shallow water with your paddle, if you're paddling up in a kayak, or you actually have to get out and, uh, you know, you come to a riffle, or a, a set of rapids or something like that, uh, that you actually uh, have to get out. You're, you're actually seeing flowing water, okay? When you hit that, you know you're in white bass country then. So uh, again, just start motoring up or paddling up some of these tributaries until you um, find flowing water, uh, riffles, rapids, uh, shallows. And that's not necessarily to say that all the white bass are gonna be located in those areas. Again, early in the season, they're going to be located in some of the deeper holes in um, 
some of the slower water, but as they move up to actually spawn and we're, you know, I really like to pursue them or, or target them uh, during this, during the run, uh, we're going to look for them in that, that shallower moving water. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, uh, show you a little bit. Um, uh, I've, got, I've got a few pictures here, uh, some different rivers uh, here in Texas. And these were, of course, this was taken um, very, very early spring or actually uh, late winter, I should say, there's no foliage on the trees. But if you can see, I'm gonna try to kind of draw on this. Let's see here, okay. So if you can see, there's a little, I'm gonna draw a red line right across the screen here. Uh, in the foreground here, toward the bottom of the screen, you're gonna notice that the water is uh, fairly shallow. You can see down to the bottom, it is clear. You can see the gravel. It's probably about 10 inches deep right there. But where that red line is, you notice that that uh, water flowing over that gravel bar gets substantially darker, um, but that's, because it's dropping off into a, a deeper pool or, or, or a hole, okay? So if I, if I was going upstream uh, in my boat or in my kayak or wading upstream from an access point and I, I found a place like this, it would actually be a very good place to try and stop, okay? Because you have, you have A, you have flowing water. You can see the water in the, in the foreground is flowing here. The current here is actually moving um, this way and it's dumping off into this hole, okay? So when fish are moving upstream, uh, if they're not spawning, they're going to be waiting right below a set of rapids or, or a riffle or some faster water, faster shallow water, or they're gonna be waiting right above that set of rapids, okay? So right here in this deep hole up against this bank, would actually be a very good place to find fish, all right? I would probably stand right here along this red line that demarks, uh, is the demarcation line between the shallower riffle and that deeper water. And I would cast out toward that uh, bank over there with all the trees on it, let my fly get deep and uh, strip it back. And hopefully I'll find a school of white bass there ready, uh, you know, maybe in that evening to come up and spawn uh, up in the, the shallower, uh, gravelly riffles there. Okay. And all right. How to <laughs> get it out of this. Click on the screen again. Click on the screen again and then you should be able to move it. Well, I'm, I'm not. You close the annotating. It's, well, it's still annotating uh, for some go. reason. Click on that red X to okay. close your annotation. Okay. And then you should have it. Let me click off the screen. There we go. All right. All right. Yeah, okay. go ahead, Kira. So one of the questions is, um, any suggestions for Lake Livingston on the Trinity River and any white bass near Lake Somerville? And I did post the Facebook page for Texas Freshwater Fly Fishing and said that's a really good place to find out what's going on fishing now. Do you have any feedback on Trinity, uh, Lake Livingston, or Somerville? I, I don't on the Trinity. I do know uh, that along the Trinity, uh, there's, I, I've never fished that river for white bass before, but I do know along the Trinity, uh, they're uh, at a place called the Lock and Dams. There were some old, uh, locks um, there for, uh, for ships and, and, and boats moving upstream uh, that down below that can produce. I've read, uh, I've read uh, several articles about that. So that, that area can, um, but again, you're gonna have to just kind of, you know, do a Google search and um, there's, there's a lot of information out there about that, but uh, there's no doubt that Livingston with, Tr with the Trinity flowing into it uh, if you go up the Trinity River uh, upstream, you're gonna, you, you should run into white bass there. And they're probably on Livingston, there are probably a lot of other feeder creek uh, as large as that reservoir is. So you should be able to find some fish there. Um, now, 
um, Somerville. Uh, again, I've never fished that before, but I do know that uh, flowing into Somerville, I believe it's Yegua Creek. Um, is a very popular spot and that can be accessed by some Corps of Engineer land. Again, you're going to kind of have to do your homework there. Um, but uh, I do know that that has some strong white bass runs up uh, Yegula Creek. So uh, that is a very good lake for, for uh, springtime white bass. Okay. And um, another question is, uh, is the water temperature 55 to 60 for the lake or the stream? It would actually be up in the stream where they're spawning. Okay, yeah. good. So the, the, the lake may be substantially different, uh, be it if you're in a shallow cove or if you're, you know, fishing somewhere where the water is 55 feet deep. Um, so we're looking at the water uh, up in the tributary uh, where, where the water's flowing, moving uh, in the habitat. Like I said, the shallow gravelly shoals, uh, that's kind of where it needs to be in that target range. Okay, and the last question to handle just for right now is, does mid-March still hold true in 2021 after that <laughs> snowpocalypse? That's a good question for us all, I think, Pat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I really can't say that. I mean, fish are fish and they're, you know, just like all wildlife, they are, they're funny creatures. You can go out sometimes on rivers fishing for not only white bass, but large mouth or whatever. And you think you're just going to absolutely have a great day and you end up just struggling so there's there's no predicting what fish are going to do at any given time but um but again that all just depends on uh, the weather and like i said we've had some really good warming trend uh, over the last couple of weeks and you know prior to the cold front blowing in today uh had some epic winds out of the north uh, just a few hours ago outside uh it was very very mild outside um this morning um so Again, um, you're, you're just going to have to kind of get out there and, and take a look. But I would say that uh, with the fish starting to show up in, in a lot of the rivers now uh, and start moving up into uh, not quite, but almost their traditional spawning areas, I would say that uh, mid-March or maybe a week later, uh, later on in March uh, would be good. And they could, uh, they could spawn all the way into April. All right. All righty. Okay. This next picture, um, if you remember the last picture, I'll just kind of go back to that one really quick. I just turned around pretty much right in my tracks and I took a shot upstream. Okay. So you see a, a, a little connecting run right there for back, lack of better words. And it is, it's no more than again, about 10 inches deep at its deepest point. Um, and you can see over here, again, let me, um, let me start doodling over here. You can see over here, there's a gravel bar. That bar right there is actually out of the water. And you can just see right through here, there's a little trickle of water coming through. Okay. So uh, again, places like this above and below a set of ripples, riffles, excuse me, or rapids, uh, or play, you know, the first deep hole below the rapids and the first deeper hole up above the rapids are typically really good places to look for white bass. Um, depth is relative. People say, well, how deep? Um, it doesn't have to be that deep. If the surrounding water is, just, you know, maybe a foot and a half deep or two feet deep, uh, deep could be four feet deep, okay? It just needs to be a little bit deeper. Again, when these fish push up, these uh, these areas uh, to spawn, they're going to they're going to dump off in these deeper holes and, and wait until usually uh, I've seen spawning occur uh, mainly during the evening, uh, almost right at dark. Uh, so they're going to wait in these holes above or below these uh, riffles and rapids to uh, to actually spawn. Okay. All right. Oops. All right, so here's a here's a closer uh, closer view oops, of um, of that particular uh, particular area that we were just looking at, and um, you'll see that again it it's just wet gravel there. It doesn't take much for a white bass to move upstream. Uh, they they can they can move up 
literally in you know three inches of water i've seen them go on their sides sometimes moving up uh, almost like again like a salmon uh, but again you can see there's just a little bit of deeper water right in here but again notice out in here um, you can see all the way to the bottom and that's nice clean gravel and it doesn't look like it but there is a bit of current flowing over that gravel and that is an that is a classic uh, spawning area for white bass. Uh, they will definitely get on that little flat right there in the evening and spawn. In fact, uh, I've come up to that spot many times in the evening and you, you see v wakes shooting away from it. Uh, and, and those are the fish that are actually up there uh, preparing to spawn. And of course they, you know, they're, they're, uh, they have predators from above, herons, uh, um, cormorants and whatnot uh, and so they're a little bit spooky and and they'll just kind of just jet back and dump off into the deeper hole deeper hole are going to be in this particular area you can see a deeper hole probably right over there again you can wade out along that flat cast up against that uh, kind of limestone bank rocky ledge over there in that deeper water and uh, you can catch some fish uh, that that's again just a classic classic area to, uh, to catch white bass there. Okay. Oops. Try to clear. Remember my to go up to I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Remember to go uh, up to clear. You got it? Yeah, it's a, uh, I'm Just not sure why. There it goes. I, I don't think I'm, I'm I don't think I'm, uh, <laughs> leaving it up long enough. Okay. No, we still, there you got it, you got it. Okay, all right. Um, again, we're looking at this same area. This is actually that same bank uh, that I was showing you just a second ago. And uh, this is actually in the morning. Um, and uh, this is a, a client of mine a few years back and we had found some fish upstream of this spot, but uh, uh, but not a lot. Uh, there was a few fish in between, but when we came back down in, in my boat, uh, we came to that little gravel spawning flat there, and there were fish all over it, and as soon as they saw the boat coming, they just went right back down uh, right here. Again, uh, y'all have to forgive me again. This whole annotation thing is, I'm, I'm trying to yeah, we kind can, of... We can see your cursor, so if you just want to move okay. your across the okay, screen cool that helps. cool so right right in here up against this bank those fish just dumped off in that deep water and um, I told the gentleman I said we're going to catch some fish now and uh, so I just anchored the boat right there and uh, he started casting up against that bank and letting his uh, clouser minnow go down deep in that water and uh, he had a really good morning a uh, really good morning right there all right uh, this is another uh, an area you see there's the, in this particular river the water is kind of spread out here uh, actually but if you if you take a look right up here kind of in the middle of the screen where my pencil's going back and forth you can see that it really necks down and you can see kind of kind of there's some bubbles over here or some foam this is a really, really neck down area of the river. And when any river or creek pinches down or necks down, all of that water has to flow through it. So it's gonna start moving a lot, lot faster, okay? So what do you have here? You actually, you have a bunch of current, okay? So that current is actually moving this way, okay? So it's, it's moving that way, it's moving toward us on the screen and it, it's spilling out into a much deeper hole. So where are we going to find the fish here? All right. Um, it actually gets deeper, kind of right in here. But again, also right up along this bank over here, you're going to find some deeper water. Um, these are spots to look for. Any river across the state of Texas, uh, you're, you're going to find white bass in, in places like this. Again, this is right below a... a set of riffles or a faster run and it dumps off from a shallow area into a deeper area okay also of note right here oops it's kind of over in this particular area 
it's still, it's quiet, okay? There's no current, all right? So you might wanna take a few casts there uh, in that, that, that quieter water uh, that, that's really not affected by the current so much uh, before you know proceeding out further and, and fishing some of that water uh, up against that bank, which is gonna have a little bit hotter current flowing over, over the top of it. And Pat, someone asked what river is that that picture is? What, what river is this? This yes. is actually a middle, this is actually a middle Bosky river. And do you have the geographical locations of that exact? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> All right. So this is, um, again, let me, oops, sorry about that. Let me try to erase that here in a second. If I can get this thing to pop up, there it goes. And clear my drawings. There we go. All right. So here's again, here's another classic spot, folks. Um, you're, you're, you're looking at a, you know, a four or five inch deep riffle and up ahead, up in, up in this area, the water's coming this way. Oops. Water is coming this way towards us. Okay. So again, these fish are going to push up against the current and they're going to dump off in the deep, in, in deep holes. Okay. So you're going to just, you know, as, as you go through a, a shallow area like this, you're going to notice there's some kind of some spawning gravel over here on the left hand side. Over here on the right hand side, it's, it's, it's kind of calmer, uh, but still has enough current flowing over it to push those eggs down. You're going to notice this is a good uh, spawning flat as well. You'll see a lot of fish up in that shallow water in the evening, uh, but most fish are going to push on up and they're going to find deeper hole uh, upstream of, of spots like this. And clear out of this. All right. So here's another, uh, you know, this is the river's wider here in this particular location. Um, there's not really any current flowing um, that you can see. There's no riffle or run here. So, so where do you look where you're going to find fish? Well, there's actually still a little bit of current blowing down the river. Um, so white bass, they're not going to just, you know, you know, go into the, if, let's, let's put it this way in, in, in human terms, if there's a barn out in the middle of a field in, in Kansas and the wind's blowing down from the north in Canada from, you know, and it's about 30 degrees out, are you going to stand in that 50 mile an hour north wind or are you going to go and you know, tuck behind that barn. And most all rivering fish here in Texas, especially largemouth, they're, they're kind of lazy. They, they want to tuck down out of the current, uh, but white bass are no different. So as they're pushing up in areas like this, again, depth is relative. So if you see a little pothole that's deeper, uh, that has maybe some current breaks like rocks, um, maybe a, a brush pile, something like that. Those are always good places to uh, take a few casts and they don't have to be big. Uh, areas as big as the hood of your truck or car uh, can, hold, uh, can hold quite a few fish. So uh, if you'll take a look over here, I'm gonna draw this circle. You'll notice that right up against that rock, right in here, it's a really dark area, it's shadowy. Um, that, and it, the water's just darker there. That, that indicates there is some depth to it. Uh, you can see, and, and plus there's some rocks uh, kind of right in here that are blocking the current. Um, you'll see some rocks right up in this area and some darker holes up in here. So these are things to look for. You might not be able to see these uh, or see this type of habitat uh, all across the state of Texas. And, you know, this is not going to look like the Sabine River. Uh, it's not going to look like the Trinity. Um, you know, so, so every river is a little bit different. So you're looking for some you know, if you don't find riffles or rapids, you're looking for maybe depth changes uh, where the water gets a little bit deeper. Maybe it goes from three feet to five feet. Uh, maybe there's a, again, you're looking for some current breaks there. Uh, so those are kind of the things that, uh, 
uh, that you need to keep an eye on uh, if you don't actually have riffles and runs uh, on your particular on your particular stream uh, where you're fishing, or a lot of them, I should say. Okay, so here we're. Um, oops, clear that. Here we're looking at an area uh, where we have a feeder creek coming in, and feeder creeks are always a good place to try and stop and fish, uh, no matter if you're fishing for white bass or you're fishing for, for largemouth or sunfish or whatnot. And you can see up in that creek uh, as it's flowing in, you'll see that that water is much, much clearer. It's kind of got a, a clearer green color to it. And the water coming down the main channel uh, is, uh, is, is pretty turbid. It, it's, it's very murky, actually. So this is a this is a great place to, to catch white bass, except for that darn tree that uh, is kind of in the way and may get your fly there. But uh, we have a lot of things uh, kind of going on. Number one, we have a uh, we have a color break or a color line here that separates the water flowing in from the creek, the feeder creek, which again uh, may be a big draw because it may have a different water temperature coming in. That water may coming in from that creek may be a lot warmer. Okay, so it may pull a bunch of fish right up at the mouth there. Uh, so you have a, a color line. Um, fish like to sit on color lines and ambush bait, ambush bait fish. Okay, so you also have because of the, this, you know, this big sand point right here. Kind of draw a little shark fin, but you have uh, you have a current break. It's pretty strong right here. That current's flowing on the main stem of the river, but back here where this creek is. This water is, um, this water back in here is actually fairly quiet. Again, except for that darn tree that's sticking out in the way, this would be a really good spot to look, look for on, on your particular rivers. Okay. Um, here we've got another, um, this is almost kind of like that uh, picture that we looked at just a second ago. Um, except the river here, uh, this is a, a different location. This is much, much wider, okay? But it's, it, it's basically, it's the same thing, okay? You have, you have an area uh, right in here, the water's flowing this way, but you have an area up in here, up in this area, the river is actually necked down, okay? So a lot of water is kind of squeezing through a tight area. So we've got a lot of current pushing through. But once it comes around this sandbar um, here, you're gonna see that it, you know, the river widens. So that current's got a lot of places to go. Um, you, can kind of, you can kind of look at this picture. It's, it's a little bit hard to tell. But again, on the backside of this sandbar over here, Here's your barn in, in, the, in, in the middle of that field in Kansas that's kind of blocking the wind, okay? There's, a, there's kind of a quiet area. There's a little pocket kind of right back in this, this area that's going to be out of that main current. And you can find a lot of fish stacked up, again, kind of right below this run, all right? So uh, another good area to cast Again, you can barely see it, but the, there's a current line right in here. And it's coming off the tip of that sandbar. And so you'll have a little back eddy, a quieter, quieter area where the fish will kind of hold and wait uh, so before they push up. Again, no different than that smaller area that we looked at uh, a while back, the same situation, neck down uh, area of the river with some faster water coming in it. It's just in a little bit bigger uh, river. So this is something you, you know you may look for um, maybe out in East Texas a little bit um, where the rivers may be a little bit broader than we have here in some of the rocky uh, streams in Central Texas. Pat, let me ask this while you're there. A lot of people sure. have said, uh, so someone wanted to know um, when to cast, let the fly float with the current or against it. Several people have asked about flies. I'm sure you'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, someone said uh, types of line floating or sinking, but I think probably the, um, and also what about larger bodies of water from main lake or coves? So um, this is mostly about the, the white bass run, but if right. you could do that in. Um, 
Right. Yeah. The, the flies and the retrieves and uh, all the line and gear, we're going to definitely cover that in detail here in, uh, in a little bit. Um, but those are all, that's all the, those are all good questions. If you're on a reservoir um, and again, you know, there's, there's not a lot of rain and there's not a lot of current in your creeks or the rivers that are feeding that reservoir. Again, some of the places that you can look are points. Um, uh, you know, where a point of land goes out onto the main lake and the wind hits it, uh, whether it be, you know, a strong north or south wind and it blows across that point. Um, just think that point is still, you know, it's still out there kind of submerging down in the water. So what you see above, land, above water is actually continuing down underwater. So um, especially if those points have rocks on them, uh, that wind blowing across those uh, rocks on those points are definitely enough to uh, uh, provide a little bit of wind blown current actually. So those, those fish can actually, you know, spawn on that. Another great place is just along uh, a dam uh, along the riprap where they've dumped, you know, all those granite boulders. Um, you know, that if you can find the wind blowing along that a certain direction, you know, definitely you can, uh, you can, you can try areas like that. If you don't have rocks, sandy points um, that, that jut out into the lake, uh, again, uh, the main thing you're looking for is something where the wind is coming across it. And uh, the best, the best spots on any reservoir are going to be a point uh, where wind is blowing across it. Uh, if, if the white bass are going to spawn in conditions like that. Okay, on um, this particular uh, slide, uh, got a, again, we've got several things going on here. Um, we've got some current moving down. The current's kind of flowing down this way. And right here, it's very hard to see, but you can, um, it's the, the water's fairly clear here, but you can maybe make out the, the bottom. Right in this area, there's a big sandbar big gravel ball right in the middle of the river, okay? So we've got the current coming down. It's blowing down this side. Uh, but what, but the, uh, the features that we're really looking for over here on this opposite side, you see those two big brush piles, okay? And you can actually see the current line kind of curling off from this one. And you see the current line coming off of this one right here as well. So again, it, it's that whole barn in a windstorm thing. These fish want to kind of get out of that current while they're waiting to, you know, do their thing and spawn. Um, so we have a, some, some really classic habitat here. We've got a big current break and we've got relatively deeper water. Okay, the, on this, this gravel bar, it, again, it looks deep. It, it's, it's maybe 18 inches. But over here, it's about three feet deep. And you've got this little hole, this little pocket of quiet water right here and right here. Quieter, deeper water. Um, and you've got, you've got the current coming by. Just classic places to find white bass. This is actually that same spot. This is several years later. Um, this is one of my clients and he, uh, the, the, the gravel bar had since shifted. <laughs> you can see the gravel bars right here now. Um, and that's one of the cool things I should mention about rivers is that they're never the same uh, from year to year. Uh, you have a big flood, uh, get a lot of rain and stuff moves around, gravel shifts where it may have been five feet deep, maybe six inches the next year because the gravel filled that hole in due to the hydraulics and the currents and, and whatnot. So uh, a lot of things stay the same uh, or relatively the same, but, but some, of the, some of the little pockets and holes uh, can, can be different. And it, it, those little pockets and holes can hold a dozen fish. So you have to really kind of, again, I said uh, a few slides back, it, it may not take a, an area that's, you know, just bigger than your car hood or around the same size of your car hood. Uh, it can hold quite a few fish. So you really need to kind of uh, learn what to look for and kind of key in on those areas. 
but you see where I drew the arrow, there's the gravel bar here. And you can clearly see the current coming right off the edge of that gravel bar right here. And it, uh, it's actually coming down this way too. Okay, it's kind of making a V. And these fish were stacked up right here on that current line, right in that quieter water back there. And so he was just casting out over this current, letting his fly uh, sweep down, get to death, and stripping it back in. And uh, those were that's where the fish were. Again, you have an area where there's a ripple, riffle or a rapid, uh, some moving water, and you have a little bit of quieter water or a deeper hole right next to it, right below it, and a classic white bass spot. Okay. So again, another uh, another slide here. Um, going to take a look at uh, some more water. Pretty much the same thing, uh, it, but it's just a it's just a different setting. Um, you've got a a really necked down area of the river from here to here, up against this big limestone bluff, and the water's pouring down. At a pretty good clip. The water was really moving when I took this picture, but it's flowing this way. Okay. And you've got this big gravel bar right here. You can see the edge of that gravel bar. So again, where are we going to find our fish? Well, they're definitely not going to be out there just getting beat in this heavy water right here. They're, they're just not going to hold in here. But you can see the current line between the soft water, which is the quieter water, and the heavier water up against that uh, bank over here on this side. And again, it's right along this current seam in this quieter water where typically the fish are going to hold in, in something, uh, you know, if you come across a, a, an area like this. Okay. And this is just a kind of a, you know, this is the same, same particular spot um, at lower flows. You can see the water was coming down this way, much lower flows actually. Uh, but uh, this is several years back and this is a client and he's hooked up with some fish. The, the, the fish were actually holding in uh, just some deeper water here, just downstream of that fast water. Okay, kind of the same thing. Um, as we're, we're moving on, you're probably kind of getting the hang of this um, stuff now as far as, you know, where, where you're going to actually find fish. Um, again, you notice over here, you can see the white water. That water was really cooking this particular day. That water's flowing this way. But notice right over here, there's a giant sandbar that uh, my, uh, this is my old boat actually, is parked up against. And you can almost see right here where I'm kind of drawing around with the pencil. Look at it, it almost looks like a whirlpool or a, you can almost see the current backwashing on itself. There was actually a big eddy or a backflow that was kind of doing this number right here, okay? So you've got quieter water over here. They're not gonna be out in this really, really fast stuff. Uh, so again, you have a good current break here between the fast water and the softer water in here. Here's where you want to focus your efforts, right in here. Okay, a couple of more here, and we'll kind of move on to some, uh, some different topics. Again, uh, you see there's a big, it almost looks like a dam, but it's just a big gravel bar that's coming all the way across. And you can see the water is just barely trickling over it right here. I bet it's no more than three inches deep in most of these spots. So up above, it's real quiet. Down below, it's real quiet, but there's still some current pushing. Again, um, you know, it's they're 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 going to be in one or two places. They're going to be 
in that first downstream hole. It's got relatively deeper water. You know, you're looking at something like about there. Or we're going to go to the next picture, and it's going to be of the exact same area, just on a different day. And you can see that uh, you can see that little gravel bar where that water was trickling over in that direction. And you can see that deeper hole right above it. Those fish will push up those little riffles or rapids and they'll dump off into this deeper water. You can see it's almost waist deep here. Um, this is one of my nephews and the fish were just right up against, they were in the actually in the deeper water right up here over against uh, the bank in this particular spot. So again, the first deep hole up above a set of rapids, the first deep hole down below the set of rapids are really key spots to look. Okay, here's a kind of a little bit different uh, location. But you can see this water is really moving through here. The river is neck down and it's, it's, very, the current's very strong coming through this little chute. Okay, again, where my red line and arrow is, uh, fish are not going to hold. It's just the water is flowing too fast. But what we do have that's really interesting is up over here against this bank. See that nice little quiet water there? You see you've got a big rock that's blocking the current prime place for fish to hold. They're moving upstream. Um, they're going to come up and they're going to be fighting this current the whole way. And it's like, oh, here's a place we can dump off in right here. And they're going to rest. Again, that little spot right there can hold maybe two, three dozen fish. Okay. So all of these little spots like that uh, on your way up a river are, are worth a few casts um, to kind of see if, uh, see if they're actually holding any fish. Okay, Pat, let me ask you a question, a couple of questions. Number sure. one, do white bass face upstream or do they move around in these spots? Yes, white bass, um, unless they're spawning, they'll be going, when they're spawning, they're go, they go all kind of different directions. Uh, they're just zooming all over those little gravel flats with the current on them. Uh, you know, the you'll usually have one female that's, uh, you know, about ready to drop her eggs and, uh, you know, she's being pursued by, uh, you know, a pack of males. And so you're going to, you're going to, you're going to see that. But for the most part, yes, these fish are going to always point upstream uh, with their noses upstream. Um, you know, they're just more aer aerodynamic like that. Uh, if you look at a trout, uh, any trout stream, uh, largemouth bass, any fish, and, uh, you know, that's having to face a lot of current is definitely going to be pointing uh, pointing upstream because that's just the way they're more uh, more aerodynamic. And one other question: uh, Somebody said they uh, rarely get water clarity like you have. Um, do you uh, do you have any recommendations or adjustments to make for murky water? Yeah, um, and you know we'll talk about that a little bit as when we talk about fly selection. Um, and, and colors and yeah. all, but uh, they can still be caught in, in uh, chocolate milk, as I like to call it, um, but, uh, but definitely. Um, and that can actually be a, uh, a really good, um, that, that can actually be a big help, I should say, uh, because when the water is murky, the fish are less spooky. In, in clear water, if they can see you, or if you can see them, they can see you, and they can get they can get a little bit spooky and, um, you know, they can get a, a case of lockjaw sometimes and they won't, won't bite. So clear water, although it's pretty to fish, it, it can be tough at times. Thanks. Okay. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about water levels and weather. Uh, you really have to watch the water levels on your stream. Right now here in Central Texas, we have uh, had very little rain over this fall and winter. Uh, so. You know, we've been looking at really low water levels uh, comparatively to last year. You know, some of the waters uh, that I fish, uh, last year we were looking at 200 cubic feet a second to 150. 
currently we're looking at, you know, 30 to 40 in, in some locations or even lower. Um, so uh, right now, uh, if we had a, with this uh, weather warming up, if we could get a good three or four inch rain to raise the water level, it would really do a lot of good to really push a lot of fish up, okay? But uh, you need to watch the water levels on your uh, particular rivers that you're going to fish, uh, not only for, for white bass, uh, you know, when they're going to be moving up because they need that current to spawn, but also for safety. You don't, definitely you don't want to be out there when the, the, the river is just raging. Uh, again, uh, the second bullet there's current equals white bass. Um, again, where, where I like to fish for them with a fly rod uh, is in that shallower water, shallower moving water, and that's where they're going to be actually up spawning. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's kind of what you need. You need that that flowing water again for those fish to be uh, kind of up there in that that skinny stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about resources for water levels in Texas, uh, USGS, and, and some of the uh, gauging stations and whatnot, and you know how weather uh, can affect the fish, and uh, particularly cold fronts because it is spring. It is Texas. Uh, again, we had a little ice age two weeks ago, and you know now it's 74 degrees this morning or whatever. So it's still added if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute. Um, so, you know, April, you know, you can get some really nasty cold fronts come through, so. All right, so resources for water levels in Texas. It's a Texas USGS uh, website um, for current water data. And again, this is gonna be recorded, so you can come back and, uh, you know, look at this website, or you can just Google uh, Texas Water USGS. And what you should, should see, you should see a page that's going to have this map uh, on it, uh, maybe up in one of the corners or something like that. You can click on it. And what's cool is all of these little colored dots all across the state are gauging stations on particular rivers. And you can actually go and hover your mouse over those, uh, those colored dots, and it's going to tell you what river that is. Um, and you can click on it and you can get a bunch more information, okay? The colored dots mean what stage are those particular streams flowing. Um, you know, I, I believe red is for lower flows or, or no flows. Uh, the blues, the turquoise, is it getting up there? Dark blue is really getting up there. And black is, you probably don't want to be white bass fishing on that particular river. Uh, the oranges and reds are, are some of your lower flows. But if you go and you click on, again, if you, um, this is not an active web page, but let's say this little red dot right here, if I was to hover my, uh, you know, cursor over there on that website and click on it, it would bring up a page. Um, we'll get to it here in a second. This is what a USGS uh, gauging station looks like. They can take many different forms, but there are these kind of little funny looking aluminum houses uh, all across the state, right on bridges, right before you uh, go across a, a river. And you can see uh, it has a, an antenna and, and whatnot. It's probably got a, a battery in here, uh, but it's sending, it's, uh, its sensors are down in the water, uh, down there in the riverbed, and it's sending telemetry about every 15 minutes to tell you what the river's doing. So here's, when you click on one of those dots, you're gonna get a page that's gonna have a bunch of graphs on it. Uh, here's kind of the, the main one that I look at, the discharge and cubic feet a second. <clears throat> this one uh, was uh, particularly for the uh, North Bosque River uh, at Valley Mills, Texas. Uh, there's a gauging station on a highway that crosses just outside the town of Valley Mills. You can see that the river for uh, this particular year, I think it was in 2018, it was flowing along at less than 20 cubic feet a second. Here's 10 down here to the bottom line. And it was doing about 18 cubic feet a second. All of a sudden we got a good rain and that thing shot up to almost 6,000 cubic feet a second, okay? So over, over the course of a few days, that river really came up. And, you know, I know that that's upstream of, you know, where we're fishing. Uh, so I know that that water may take a day or so 
uh, half a day or so uh, to get down this far. Okay, so you really, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to rain right in the location that you're going to fish, but if there's a big shower or a big bunch of rain uh, up on the headwaters of that river just above that, uh, that can be a good thing for you. So you have to really watch the weather, not only where you are, but up above, uh, upstream of, uh, of your location. Here's another, uh, here's another picture. This is a more volatile river. I'll say volatile. Um, you can see the slight, you know, it, it did jump up a bit, but it doesn't jump up like this. This is a flash flood, folks. This is a flash flood on, um, on a graph, okay? That river was hardly even flowing. If it was doing one or two cubic feet a second on uh, February 21st there, 2018, and then all of a sudden a big rain came and wow, it shot up in a matter of a few hours to over 600 cubic feet a second, okay? So this is a very rocky river. It's on a limestone bed. The water has nowhere else to go. Uh, so you can uh, know your river. I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't speak to, you know, what you're going to deal with in your particular uh, area of Texas, uh, but, but definitely know your river and, you know, know if it comes up slowly or if it, you know, is prone to flash flooding because you really don't want to be out there when it's when it's flash flooding. So what's the optimum cubic feet a second for white bass? Well, it, it, it is relative. Um, let's say the river's been flowing, it's mid-March and it's been flowing at five cubic feet a second. And all of a sudden, uh, late March, we get a rain and it rises 30 cubic feet a second. Those fish can detect that, I promise you. And you know, even a small increase in current can cause the fish to, to move upstream and spawn. A lot of times they'll just sit down a little bit further downstream and they'll wait it out until they get optimum, you know, conditions to spawn. And if they don't, if they never do, some of them move back down the lake, they'll spawn on those windy points, or some of them just absorb their eggs, you know. But again, typically in Texas, we, we have enough rain to, you know, move the, move the water for a decent spawn. Uh, sustained flows of around 75 to 200 cubic feet a second are good, but again, that's relative. If you've got a much larger river, um, it may be flowing a lot faster than that, but it just doesn't look like it um, because the river is so spread out. So again, watch those upstream gauges of the water uh, uh, or the river upstream from where you're fishing. If that water is rising, it may take a day or two to get down to you, but it will eventually. And um, uh, when it does, uh, again, the, we had the question about fishing in dirty water. Uh, you may have a day or two of really dirty water. Uh, if the water is not flowing that fast, you can actually get out there and fish. Those fish will move up. It may take, a, again, it may take a, a day or so to move up to where you are, um, but the water coming down may be, again, dirty. The fish coming up, uh, they're going to get in those little areas, again, that are right out of the current. Uh, they don't want to sit there in that current. So, uh, you know, get out there and fish just as long as it's not, uh, not dangerous to do so. Um, again, probably anything over 2000 CFS is dangerous. You don't, you don't want to be wading uh, in water really over anything over 500. Um, but anything over 2000, you know, unless you've got a larger boat is just dangerous. Just wait until the water drops some and uh, <clears throat> the river clears up. It's just it's no fun. So this picture is going to kind of, um, you know, prompt me to talk about fishing in cold fronts. Um, this is a couple of years ago in April. And uh, this was one of my clients. It was her and her husband and her son. And uh, it was probably upper 20s that morning. But the fish were there. They were up in the river. Um, but we had a wicked cold front come through that night before and uh, had a trip booked. Uh, for that morning, and I said, how about, you know, if y'all can swing it, can we uh, wait until uh, the afternoon to go where it warms up a bit? And they did, uh, and the water didn't warm, the, the water did not cool off that much, uh, and the fish were still there, and they were still biting. Um, so if you have, you know, a situation where you're on fish, you're finding fish, you're catching them, Temperatures have been in the mid 60s to mid 70s. It's just glorious chamber of commerce spring weather. 
and all of a sudden you get a wicked cold front that comes through. Um, I promise you, if you go out there in the morning and it's 30 degrees, you're probably going to be the only boat out there. Uh, unless there's, you know, some weirdo like me out there chasing the fish. Um, but, uh, you know, you're going to have the river to yourself and the fish are still going to be there. That water temperature is not going to drop that quickly overnight with, you know, a, a front like that. Uh, the main factor you're going to find in, in, in particularly in, in situations like that are the changes to the fish's behavior based on barometric pressure. Um, you may have to fish a little bit slower uh, for them. Um, and, you know, it, it may be, the fishing may be a little bit tougher, but if you were catching fish in one hole uh, the night before when it was 73 degrees and it's 30 the next morning because a, a crazy cold front blew through, um, the fish are still going to be in that hole. Um, it, you know, if, if it's an extended cold snap, it may move them down a few days later. Okay. But um, you can tell uh, they, they had a, a pretty good evening that, that uh, particular evening. And uh, uh, she, was, uh, she was having fun catching a lot of white bass, even though she was bundled up. So we're going to talk a little bit about fly, oops, excuse me, fly equipment for white bass and it's probably a uh, section of the uh, presentation most of you folks have been waiting for or want to know a uh, little bit about. But as far as fly rods go, you know, four to six uh, weight fly rod is, is about right. Um, of course, the middle ground there is a five weight rod. Uh, you can go heavier or you can go lighter. Whatever you have, if all you have is a seven weight you know, don't worry about it. Go out there and fish it. If all you have is an eight weight, go out there and fish it. You know, maybe a little bit heavy for, you know, that uh, size of a fish, but, um, you know, don't let that stop you. Uh, you know, people like to fish ultralight fly rods and two new weights. Uh, if that's what you got, go out there and fish them. Um, but typically four to six weight is what I like for throwing some of the flies that, uh, or some of the uh, sink tip lines and uh, weighted flies that we use. Uh, you notice uh, kind of right here, um, if you're new to the fly fishing game, I'm kind of moving my cursor back and forth and you're buying your first fly rod, uh, whatever brand you buy, make sure it's got a lifetime warranty on there or at least some type of warranty. Fly rods are long, uh, flimsy poles. <laughs> Uh, they're very easy to get caught up in brush or whatnot. Most of them are anywhere from eight and a half to nine feet long, and the tips of them can break. Okay, so you want to make sure you're going to go with a company that has some type of warranty. And I'm going to give a shout out to uh, some, some local folks up in Dallas. Uh, they've been building rods, not only fly rods, but conventional rods for quite some time, and that's TFO or Temple Fork Outfitters. Um, they make great rods uh, at several different price ranges, uh, but all of them are, are fairly affordable. Um, and, you know, they, they, they also sell fly reels as well, but they have a lifetime warranty on there. If you break your rod and it's a, it's a uh, lifetime warranty, it's a no fault warranty. So, you know, if you accidentally step on your rod or whatnot, uh, you can send it in with $30 and uh, they'll either repair it or send you a new rod. Okay. So, Make sure, you're, again, whatever rod your, your uh, company you're going with, that it has a, a warranty on it. Okay. Fly reels, keep it simple. I mean, we can, you can get off into the crazy weeds uh, uh, with fly reels, too. There, uh, there are some beautiful reels out there by some great companies uh, made in America that are upwards of eight dollars $900 uh, that are machined from, you know, bar stock aluminum and have, you know, beautiful anodized finishes on them. Uh, you don't need those to catch white bass, though, I promise you. Uh, you can get a, a, a reel that, you know, costs 15 to 30 bucks and, and you're fine. Basically, as long as it holds your fly line and a little bit of, of backing, um, you're good. You're golden. Um, you don't need, a, you know, a fancy drag on that fly reel. Um, now, the... The caveat to that is if there are hybrids, uh, hybrid stripers in your river, uh, if the lake has hybrids in them, if they do, um, uh, the, the, the backing thing can come into play, but we'll talk about hybrids in, in a minute here. 
So lines, what do you what do you want for a line? Here's the main thing. Um, if you get nothing else from this presentation, the main thing for for fly fishing for white bass is you need to get the fly down to the bottom of the fish, down to the bottom where the fish are. Okay, and really with a um, you know a a floating line, you can do it, but you're going to have to fish a, a heavier fly. Okay. And I like to fish the lightest fly that I possibly can because it, it looks and it acts more naturally in the current. So if you have, uh, if you're going to get a line, I would recommend uh, a sink tip uh, line. It's down below, I think it's the fourth bullet down there. Scientific Angler's Frequency 10 foot sink tip type three. Okay, it, it's an inexpensive line. I think you can find them anywhere from like 40 to 50 bucks. And that's, you know, fairly uh, inexpensive for a fly line. Um, it's got a 10 foot sink tip on it. It's got a tight, the, the sink tip is a tight three. So it's gonna sink about three inches per second. And that's about perfect for, for, for Texas white bass. I've used those lines for years and they're excellent. Um, I can't say enough about them. But if you have a full sinking or a sink tip line anywhere from a type two to a four, Type two, the four or you know type five is going to sink faster, uh, so you know if you've got one of those and you know, currents heavier, uh, you're going to be a little bit better off because it's going to get your fly down to the bottom. But when I first started fishing for white bass with a fly rod, um, I wasn't catching a lot of fish. I'll promise you, I had a floating line, I had a long leader. You're probably your typical seven and a half foot leader. And I had a fly on that was not weighted, um, probably had some small bead chain eyes on it. And I was fishing water that was probably about four to five feet deep. And I would cast the fly out and I'd immediately begin retrieving. And the fly is probably coming on back to me about six inches below the surface. And all the white bass were down there on the bottom. I was fishing over fish. I knew the fish were there. They weren't eating it. Um, that's because the fly wasn't down there, you know, in their face, so to speak. Every once in a while, a stupid one would come up and give me hope and he would eat my fly. And I guess that kind of kept me going. But uh, over the years, I learned that you really need to get the fly down on the bottom um, with your line, either or using a weighted fly and or letting that fly, giving the fly after it hits the water time to sink, okay? Don't immediately start retrieving your fly let that fly sink, fish it down close to the bottom. Um, sink tips uh, are a little bit easier to fish uh, as far as fly lines go than a full sink line. Full sink line uh, can, if you're wading, especially all that line can get tangled around your boot, wading boots or sneakers or uh, whatever. A sink tip, uh, only about 10 to 25 feet of that tip is actually going, the, the end tip is going to sink. The rest of it floats and it's, it's a lot easier to manage and cast that way. Okay. So, what if you only have a floating line? Um, uh, maybe you got a, a, a fly rod for Christmas and it came with a floating line and you want to go out and catch white bass. Go out and fish it. Um, you will catch white bass, but just use a longer leader, okay, than the one I'm going to show you for, in a second here for the sinking or sink tip lines. Use a longer leader. Uh, anywhere from seven to nine feet and a heavier fly, maybe something with lead eyes on it to get that fly deeper, okay? Um, if you use a shorter leader, that floating line is going to act like a cork and it's going to keep that fly up toward the top. Uh, if you use, again, a floating line and a lightly weighted fly, that fly is just not going to get deep enough. So that longer leader, that longer monofilament or fluorocarbon leader is going to help that fly get down and again, using something probably with lead eyes on it, uh, depending on the current, is going to also help that fly to get down as well. Pat, what about sinking leaders? Someone just asked. Yeah, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with sinking leaders. I know some folks like them. Um, I, you know, you can you can definitely use them. One of the things about uh, you know sinking leaders, if you have a just a floating line, they're great to attach to a floating line, and they're going to help you get that extra depth. So if you have a floating line and don't want to invest in a sink tip line, uh, but uh, you know you can um, um, find a, a a sinking leader uh, in the you know five to ten foot range, 
uh, go for it. Definitely, that's going to help get your fly deeper uh, 100%, you know, especially if you've got a floating line, okay? I would not recommend a sinking leader attached to a sink tip or a full sinking line because you're you're creating another hinge. Um, if you ask most people that are kind of experienced fly fishermen, they'd rather eat a bag of dirt than throw a full sinking fly line. Uh, and they can be buggers because they're heavier. Um, uh, and, and sink tip lines that are not well made or they can, what's called hinge, where that floating line meets that sinking line, you can get a, a hinging effect and that can kind of feel you know, weird on your cast, uh, so to speak. So, uh, but, but, a you know, a sinking leader, uh, definitely for a, uh, for a floating line, I would, I would say, yes, go for it. That's going to help, help you get deeper, but not, not for a full sink or sink tip line. So if you have a full sink or sink tip line, you want to keep your leader very short and you don't have to go out and buy a fancy trout leader from scientific anglers or, you know, Rio or Orvis or whatnot. You just take some uh, uh, 18, about 18 inches of 10 or 12 pound monofilament or fluorocarbon, whatever you have, or if you have tippet material. And, you know, tie, tie a loop in uh, the, the end and connect it to your, the loop in your fly line or blood knotted or whatever. And then from there, off of that 18 inches of 10 or 12 pound test, you're going to run about another 18 to 30 inches of six pound. Uh, again, whether it be, you know, regular fly fishing tippet, whether it be monofilament, whatever you have, okay. Um, uh, and that's all you need for a leader, okay. So you've got a fly line, a piece of heavier line that kind of acts as the butt section, and then a little bit longer. So you're looking at this, you know, 18 and 18, that's 36, is three foot leader, okay, from your fly line to your fly. And that, that's all you need. It doesn't have to be fancy. And we'll show you why. So this is a little illustration that I came up with. And the orange section of the line there, that's your, let's say that's your sink tip or your sinking fly line. And think of that as kind of your weight. It's weighted. It's going to get, it's going to start dragging everything down toward the bottom of, of the river. Okay, and you see the two white bass over there, they're doing what white bass do in, in rivers in spring, and they're holding them on the bottom. And if you have, if you attach a seven and a half foot or a nine foot leader, a really long leader on there, and you have a relatively light fly, that fly is going to act like a kite in that current. And it's just going to, it's just going to fly up above those fish. And uh, again, your, your chances of, you know, catching a lot of fish in that situation are, are just going to go down. You're going to have a much better uh, day if you put a shorter leader on your sinking or sink tip line. Again, the orange is your sinking or sink tip. There's about a, you know, we're going to say, let's say a three foot leader from flying all the way to the end of the fly. And what occurs there is there's just not enough leader for that fly to, uh, that, that fly line is just gonna keep dragging it down toward the bottom, okay? It can't fly up over the top of those fish, okay? Shorter leader, it's just kind of like a shorter leash for a dog. It's just, it's going to keep that fly down in the strike zone. So here's a here's kind of a, an illustration. Um, this doesn't really have as much to do with leaders as where you're going to find fish and where you want to place your cast. Uh, <clears throat> this is kind of a split screen, split screen shot of the same thing. Up above, uh, let's just say this is a drone shot. You're looking down on the river here, and this dark blue area or this turquoise blue area is a, a deep hole in the river, okay? And these little black areas here are white bass pointed upstream. Here's the same situation down here on the bottom. You have the deep hole, uh, and, the, and the white bass sitting down here, okay? So if you cast right above these fish and there's current blowing uh, over these fish uh, in the direction of these arrows, if you cast right above these fish, you're not gonna allow that fly enough time to get down to depth, okay? And it's just gonna go right over the top of them. So 
much like in wing shooting, you have to kind of lead these fish or you have to lead the spot where the fish are sitting or the hole where the fish is sitting. So instead, cast upstream where these orange dots are. And what you're going to do is you're going to allow that fly as you're counting it down to get down toward the bottom uh, right in their face before you start retrieving. Okay, that is really key. You really need to get your fly close to the bottom. I, I can't stress that enough. Occasionally in the evenings, these fish get a little crazy sometimes, especially when they're spawning. Sometimes they'll chase the fly right up to the bank. And, uh, but that's, that's the exception. Um, you're gonna catch a lot more fish if you're fishing close to the bottom and, and getting your fly down deep. So what are we actually gonna throw for white bass? Uh, what kind of flies? Well, this is an old shot of my fly box. So those, those flies are all probably hanging in trees right now or on rocks or, uh, um, you know, some, something like that. It's, it's like Christmas time in March uh, on some of these rivers, you see all kind of tinsel and glitter and stuff hanging from the cedar elms and, and, and whatnot, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So we're going to talk about flies. First, we're going to talk about fly retrieves. You're going to have to experiment. Um, but most articles out there are going to tell you, uh, at least some of the, the, the very first ones that I read, that you want to retrieve the fly very slowly. And, you know, those folks writing those articles were um, really knowledgeable. And, um, I've, I, you know, I, I owe a lot to just uh, reading uh some of some of the articles that they wrote back in the you know 90s and uh even late 80s uh folks like joe robinson um just a legend in texas fly fishing or billy trimble um you know those those guys they fished rhymers back in the day and um probably still do and uh, you know a lot of the articles i've read just tell you to retrie retrieve the fly very very slowly um, I found uh, by watching a gentleman here in Central Texas uh, over the years, and I'll, I'll show, we'll kind of talk about him in a little bit, but he, he made that fly hop, and that was another thing. Getting the fly deep was the first key, and making that fly move is the second key. I mean, when that fly hits the bottom uh, or gets down to depth, the very first thing I do is I'll give it a probably about an 18 inch, a foot to 18 inch strip and it's very fast, like strip. Okay, and so basically that fly is drifting along and all of a sudden I just strip and it's gonna hop up off the bottom and sit there. And a lot of times you're gonna get hammered right there on that first strip. But um, I, I rarely work it slow after that, but I don't move the fly a lot. So I'm moving, I'm stripping fast, but I'm not stripping long. So I'm, I'm stripping in short three to four inch strips that I'm going to strip, 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 pause, strip, 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 pause, strip, 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 pause. Don't get into what I call a lazy strip, uh, strip, 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 strip. Okay. You really want to show those fish something that looks injured. You want to make that fly look like an injured minnow. So strip, 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 pause, strip, 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 something like that. Vary it up, keep it, you know, you want to pause it a little bit, but you want to make that fly hop and jerk and move about erratically. And uh, typically if they're very hungry, they will jerk the line out of your hand when they eat it. Sometimes uh, it, the, the bite can be in, I, I tell folks, it feels like if there's an, a plastic HEB bag floating along underneath the river, and all of a sudden you just hook into it with your fly. You just feel mush, okay? And sometimes that's just the way they're gonna eat it that day. So you've gotta, you've gotta kind of figure them out. But generally that faster retrieve that I just showed you, that faster strip with occasional pauses works the best for me. On very cold mornings, or cold fronts, or they're in a negative mood, you may have to strip slower, you know? But even then I'm probably gonna just go strip, strip, and just give it a little bit more pause, strip, 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 and just let that fly sit there and kind of marinate in front of their face uh, a little bit. But uh, another key is if you're in a kayak or whatever, even if you're waiting to help keep your fly on the bottom, 
point your uh, fly rod under the water. Uh, point your tip down under the water and that'll help keep your fly deep. Uh, Kira, do we have any questions? Um, a couple. So uh, somebody said, how far past the initial rapids will they travel to spawn? And I kind of answered that that was based on the depth of the water. Do you want to add anything to that? It depends on the river. Um, I tell you, um, you know, we've, in some of the rivers here, we've, why fish move up or, or have had fish move up 20 miles from the reservoir. Um, and it all depends on the, uh, the, the current flow. There's not a lot of current. They're going to move up about as far as they need to and they're gonna dump their eggs, you know? But if there's a lot of current, a lot of water, the fish are gonna spread out, you know? They're gonna be, uh, there's gonna be so much more habitat for them to spawn over. So they're gonna be fish for miles. And, and, you know, and all the places that we looked at, all up and down the stream, there's gonna be fish, spawning fish. And that's really cool because the run lasts longer. Those fish have to come back down the stream. So, you know, uh, you, can, you can catch the fish for a lot longer as all those fish that moved for whatever reason way up the stream, uh, 20 miles upstream, they're coming back down. So it's gonna take them a bit longer uh, to make it back down to the reservoir. So it all depends on current uh, quite, off, uh, quite often and, uh, you know, the amount of rainfall that we're getting. Another one is, uh, does it matter if the if the bait or fly is stripped upstream against the current or does it need to move downstream with or perpendicular to the current? I, I typically like to throw, um, I typically like to throw my fly across current um, and uh, let it swing down, downstream, and then I'll strip it back up, you know, at a 45 degree angle uh, into current, um, you know, it, that's generally the best retrieve right there. Uh, you don't, you really don't want, if you're, if you're having to, uh, you know, strip down current as the fly is coming down towards you, you're barely keeping up with it uh, at times and you're barely moving the fly. So I like to cast it across, let it swing down with the current a little bit and then begin, begin my retrieve if I can, if it, you know, if you're in a situation where you can actually present a fly like that. Uh, someone says, does, does barometric pressure affect white bass fishing? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, all fish have um, swim bladders and the barometric pressure, don't ask me exactly what it does, but it does something to their swim bladders um, and what passes for their little pea brains. I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't even profess to uh, tell you uh, why they do what they do, but um but cold fronts and, and, and barometric pressure changes will make fish go inactive. Um, and they can feel it coming too. Um, they can sense a cold front coming. And they, uh, generally the evening before or even right after a cold front blows through, they're going crazy. They're eating everything in sight. Uh, the next morning, again, the fish may still be in the same hole. They're just gonna be a little bit more inactive. Um, so, uh, so, you know, yeah. Uh, it, it does. It it you can ask any professional bass fisherman. They don't want to fish the day after a cold front. Uh, bright blue skies and and um, you know clear sunny cold north wind. You just don't want to fish that day. The fish are going to be tight to cover and they're just going to be in a bad mood. And um, it's it's <laughs> it's no fun generally. I can I can promise you. Um, but uh, some of the best days to fish are actually when it's kind of, you know, maybe if it was 75 and it, you know, the day before and it gets down to, you know, a minor front comes through and it's only 55 degrees and it's kind of misty and, and foggy or drizzly. Again, that's going to keep a lot of folks off the river, but it's not going to affect the fish that much. So get out there and fish for them. Again, if you like solitude, that's the time to go. Okay. Um, what do uh, white bass eat their own spawned eggs and what other fish eat white bass eggs? Uh, I have never heard of white bass eating their own uh, eggs. Uh, they may eat their own fry after they hatch, uh, you know, for a minute or uh, for a small fish. Um, but 
you know, you probably uh, bluegill, any of the smaller fish, maybe even minnows or shad uh, may pick up their eggs. Uh, carp um, may also pick up their eggs. Carp, buffalo, catfish. Um, catfish are notorious. I've seen catfish, uh, channel cat get behind spawning gar and just eat the heck out of their eggs. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, you know, but they're, for the most part, their eggs are really tiny. So, uh, and, and they're, they're tumbling along. So they're going to, they're going to spread out everywhere. So there's not going to be a big glob of them hanging on. Not like catfish. What right. are the best times of day to fish during the spawning run? And do you, uh, what do white bass prefer spawning in the evening or, uh, compared to other times of day? Yeah, I've, I've seen most activity uh, right before the sun goes down uh, as far as spawning goes. Um, but, uh, you know, go when you can go. I like fishing early mornings and late evenings. Um, but, you know, if you only have a window to fish from 11 to 2, go out there, give it a try, you know. They're, uh, they, they may be on a good bite then. You, the, the old adage, you never know unless you go. Um, so, so definitely go out there and, and give it a shot. Uh, but it seems like right before dark is just a really good time. They just kind of lose all inhibition then. And they, they really, there's usually a good bite right before the sun goes down. Another one is uh, based on the temperatures. One would then assume the Rio Frio is too cold for white bass. Would this be a correct assumption? The, uh, I, I do believe that, um, oh gosh, um, I believe there is a, uh, a run of, of White bass. fish going up that river. Yeah, I don't know much about it. I've never fished it before. It's, it's kind of not one of the rivers that, that, you know, I've heard that really typically pops up, but, um, you know, I, I would think that even in the springtime, the water's gonna warm up enough in that river. Uh, for the white bass to, to spawn there. Yeah, let us know. Whoever asked that, let us know. Um, and then where are you going to find white bass post-spawn? I don't know if you're going to get to that or not. Uh, post-spawn, they're going to move back down to the reservoirs, um, you know, or they're, you know, uh, like I said, those fish that went 20 miles upstream and, and spawned, uh, you know, post-spawn, may take them two weeks to head back down through the reservoir. So you may be catching them in spots, uh, you know, where, you know, there were good spawning habitat for other fish that they just blew right past. So you may be catching them, uh, you know, weeks uh, past where there are any spawning fish in the river, but there are still white bass in the river. But, but typically they're going to head back down to the reservoir. They're going to get in deep water and they're going to start harassing threadfin shad on main lake points and stuff like that. Just a couple more. Uh, what type of knot do you uh, use to tie a clouser minnow to a leader? I use a loop knot. Um, there, uh, I think it goes by several different, it's a non, if you Google non-slip loop knot, um, that's, it just allows for that fly to move so much better. Um, uh, if you don't like loop knots, I would just say a, a you know, seven turn clinch knot. Is, is fine, but I, I do like loop knots. Okay, and uh, someone asked, have you ever had a client used uh, a Tenkara rod? No, but they're gonna start that this year. Um, I got one last year and uh, they're a blast. They um, are, that's what I answered in the chat. <laughs> they are a blast. And uh, so we're going to, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna hit some uh, fish with Tenkara this year. So if you're interested, check check with Pat. Thanks, Pat. Go ahead. So anyway, uh, going to try to wrap up here in a few minutes. I know we've been on for a while, but uh, so if if you got maybe a, a someone that's a beginner uh, that is having a hard time just detecting strikes, you can actually put a Clouser minnow or a small marabou jig under a uh, an indicator for that you would normally use for nymph fishing with trout. Uh, there's one called a thingamabobber, which is basically a, a kind of a balloon, more or less, uh, but it's a hard plastic balloon that will float, uh, that will float your fly. And so you can put this maybe, you know, whatever depth you think the fish are at, uh, but maybe six inches off the bottom, throw, that, throw those out. And you can actually kind of 
you know, just retrieve them just like I was showing you the retrieve, but watch your strike indicator for the strike. If it goes under, certainly set the hook or jumps to the side. Uh, but another good use for strike indicators, if you want to go that route, is that the rivers are really, really low. Uh, and on occasion, we get really low rivers and the water's not moving much. So you get this really nasty algae on the bottom of the river. And um, I, I, you can see the slide, I've called it the green slimy fly clogging algae, um, but uh, on the river I may call it something else. It just will mess your flies up, it gets all in the synthetic hair or the natural hair and butt tails or whatever. But a, 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 an indicator, a thingamabobber, will actually help keep your fly above all of that mess. So what do they eat in the river? Well. Let's start with the lakes. When they're when they're actually in the lake in the you know early summer all the way through late winter before they start moving up in the river, their main forage is the threadfin shad. Okay, and these these guys they're they're eating these uh, shad anywhere from uh, an inch long to up to four inches long. Okay, but but typically when they make a run up the river, uh, they're at least in my part of the world now maybe over you know where, where y'all are fishing um maybe there was a lot of thread fins up in the rivers but where i fish their diet changes dramatically and it switches from shad to small river minnows um one of the classics i guess you could say uh for bait fishermen um are these ghost minnows or inland silver sides um I can guarantee you that one in its hand there is dead. Uh, if you look at them wrong, they just die, kind of like a shad. Uh, they, they, they're not, they're typically not very hardy. So most people will sign them and then they freeze them and they nose hook them on a little 1 16 ounce jig and they catch the heck out of white bass. Uh, but as good as these work, um, uh, if you sign at least the rivers up around here in central Texas, they're only about 5% of what you're going to haul up in the same net. But this guy is about 95%. This is, a, this is the minnow you're going to see uh, a lot across the state of Texas in most of your creeks and rivers. It's the black tail shiner. Some people call it a spot tail shiner for obvious reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, they're eating uh, the white bass go up in the rivers and they're eating these guys. And they're anywhere from one to two inches long. So that brings me to another point is don't throw a fly that is so big, or if you're a conventional fisherman, don't use a lure that's really big, okay? You want to use something that's smaller that matches the forage that these fish are actually eating. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, if your fly fisher have been around it for a little bit, you've heard the name Clouser Minna, Bob Clouser came up with this fly, I think in the late 80s. You can tie it in a billion different colors. You can tie it with bucktail or calf tail or synthetics. Um, you know, however much flash you want on it. Uh, you can tie it with bead chain eyes to make it lighter. You can tie it with lead eyes to make it heavier. Uh, but the thing is, is you really don't want to fish one over two inches long. You know, about an inch and a half to inch and three quarter. Keep it small, like a number eight or a number size six hook. Um, occasionally I'll go up to four with some really big lead eyes if the river's really, really rocking and, and you know, kind of chocolate milk and I can get away with the bigger fly, but I need more weight to get down. But if, you know, if they get really picky, uh, in very clear water, you may have to drop down to a 10, um, size 10, but typically the wheelhouse is about an eight or a six. Again, clouser, you can time in different, this is, this is one uh, tied out of craft fur, which is a synthetic. Um, but, and this one has lead eyes on it uh, versus bead chain. So if you're a fly tire, uh, you know, knock yourself out. If not, um, you know, uh, you have to go to see what they've got in the fly bins at the local shop. <clears throat> Another fly is very easy if you're a fly tire to tie. This is a marabou minna. It's just some marabou off the back of a, a, a streamer hook or a, a 2XL nymph hook little bit of flash and some chenille and some bead chain. Looks like a little minnow, catches a lot of white bass. It's not complicated. It, again, this fly is probably in a size eight. It's probably about an inch and a quarter long. 
Charlie Seipert, uh, if you've been around the fly fishing scene in Texas for any uh, length of time, you've heard uh, Charlie's name. Uh, he was a great guy. Uh, came up with this uh, really famous fly, Cypress Mylar Minna. Uh, again, uh, looking at a six, size six for a 10 and something like this. And kind of a funny story. Charlie said um, one time he was speaking to our club and he said, if your Clouser Minna has more than seven hairs on it, it's too thick. And he was halfway joking. Um, he said he could not sell Clouser minnows that he tied for himself uh, because they were too thin and people wouldn't buy them. They just didn't think they would catch fish. So he had to tie them uh, with more hair on them um, for, for shops. Another fly, a crazy Charlie. This is actually a bonefish fly, but it imitates a small river minnow pretty well. Brush Creek streamer, a good friend Chris Johnson came up with this. Uh, Chris owns Living Waters down in Round Rock. Again, looks just like a little river minnow. And this is a this is a fly that was actually uh, I found it on the internet. Uh, these guys were throwing them for snook over in Florida under dock lights, and it's tied with like clear gray synthetic fibers like Steve Ferrars Flash Blend with a little bit of flash and some epoxy over the eyes, and it looks just like a little glass minnow. Marabou jigs on a 180th ounce head. Can't beat it for a fly rod. And this is a pattern of my own design. And I, I tied this uh, or came up with this for when the water gets really clear and the conditions get tough. It, it's designed to imitate a, an inland silver side or a ghost minnow, but it's tied out of EP fibers and um, it, it gets really translucent when it's wet. Um, and uh, it works quite well in, in clear water. So really my, my, my guide box, here's kind of a shot of it, I guess last year maybe. Uh, you can see how sparsely I tie these clouds or minnows. Um, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of fur on them um, or hair on them, I should say. You don't want, you don't want that, you don't want them so uh, bushy because they're not, A, they're not gonna sink and they're just not gonna look natural so so keep the keep the materials uh, fairly sparse and you can see the color range you've got some white and uh, gray and some this color right here um, this brown with some gold flash you may not think that it really imitates the river men as well but it does it uh, it works quite well so if you're a conventional fisherman what do you use um, Again, stay small, avoid the bigger stuff. Um, I would say if you're using any jig or spinner in the 132nd to 116th ounce range, probably 116th ounce being your wheelhouse. If it's really current, you know, there's a lot of current, you can go up to 1 8 ounce. But uh, up here, this Marabou uh, Chartreuse Roadrunner, that or a white Marabou Roadrunner has, I've caught hundreds and hundreds of white bass on those. Uh, with spinning gear. Uh, same thing with the curly tail bottles. You, there's all sorts of different soft plastics you can put off of jig heads now. Um, a, a, a Texas company that's been around forever, but they, I think they just started the last few years making these again. These are the old flea fly um, jigs. Um, uh, just your regular crappie jig, you can find these anywhere. Again, your smaller ones, your 132nd, to one sixteenth ounce, a small bucktail jig in that same size, or maybe even a rooster tail spinner. So keep keep it again under two inches. Keep it small. So odds and ends to kind of wrap this up. Um, if you're if you're fishing with a kayak, and I know kayak fishing is very popular these days, you want to get a life vest, or make sure you have your life vest. Take some water along because nothing's worse than being thirsty out there, or a snack, or whatever. Make sure you've got a first aid kit or if it's sunny, uh, you know, sunscreen or you're wearing, you know, a, a buff or a, you know, a Sims sun, sunblock on your face because uh, that's, that's no fun to deal with. Make sure that if you're kayaking, you have all of your whistles, your lights, etc. And I'm not going to, um, I'm not even going to, you know, uh, try to say that I know all the rules on that. Just check with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, if, if you don't know, call your local game warden. 
uh, but but be legal out there on the water. Uh, stripping basket uh, sometimes uh, if you have a full sinking line that stuff can get tangled so if you have a stripping basket um, you know you can strip your line into that wear it around your waist. Uh, make sure you have your license and know your limits on your white bass if you're going to keep them and watch out for hybrids uh, because hybrids tend to look a lot like white bass and uh, you know, there is a size limit on them that is different than the size limit on a white bass. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll kind of cover that here in a second, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, it, it, takes a, it takes a little experience to, to know which is which out there. Um, make sure you're supporting your uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Game Wards out there and tell them, you know, thank you for doing their job because it sometimes can get a be a thankless job uh, and they're going to be out in force because they know there's a lot of folks out there on the river so they want to make sure everybody's having a good time and doing it safely and following the rules and so if you see them come up make sure you got your license ready and you know if they want to see your fish you know definitely give them fish or whatever and uh, but um, but definitely tell them thank you for being out there and doing their job uh, you don't want to be one of those guys that are on Lone Star Law I promise you um, Etiquette, uh, again, these rivers can get really crazy when the run is on and the bite's good and everybody's out there, okay? And you've got folks kind of climbing over each other. And I've seen all sorts of stuff in, in my years out on the river uh, and uh, just kind of rude behavior. Uh, so you don't want to, you don't want to be rude out there on the water. Give people their space. Uh, if you see them catching fish, don't go right in their hole on them, you know, give them their space. And, you know, typically, uh, you know, if you do and show them some respect, they'll probably invite you over. Uh, if you're fly fishing and, you know, you see a kid out there that maybe is just, you know, struggling or whatever, he's got a, you know, too big of a fly on or that color's just not working, go over there and give him some of your flies that are working or, you know, give him some advice. Just make sure you just and um, promote your, uh, your, your fly club. All right, so white bass, hybrids, and stripers. This is a Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, page and you can go to it uh, and it tells you the difference, okay? And that's pretty much all I'm gonna kind of get into on that. You can find this, uh, it's available. Uh, but as far as the legalities go, you're kind of on your own there. Just make sure that you, you know what you're looking for. Um, white bass are going to be smaller. If you catch something that puts you into your backing and it looks like a white bass, it's probably a hybrid, but not every lake has hybrids in it. That is a hybrid right there. That one's pushing about 23 inches. And that one did get me into my backing. Uh, and that was on a seven weight rod and uh, it pulled, I promise you. And this is a client with another good hybrid. That one was caught last year, actually. And here's one uh, I caught last year as well. And they, these fish, uh, again, they are stocked by Parks and Wildlife and they're bred in hatcheries and they're half white bass, half striper. Um, and they do it both ways. They, you know, male striper, female white bass or female striper, male white bass. And they're called different things. Uh, one of them is called a sunshine bass and one of them is called a palmetto bass. And I don't know which is which, um, but they can't reproduce. They think they can. So they move up the rivers in, in mass with the, with the white bass uh, most years. And uh, they can be quite a shock. So if you're gonna, use, if you're gonna fish for those guys, uh, you're gonna wanna use some bigger flies. You know, something uh, more than about four or five inches long, bigger clouds or minnows, murdich minna, or you know, this fly down here looks like a threadfin shad. My friend Matt Bennett, fly geek flies tied uh, for me. So uh, one of the things that you need to do is uh, make sure you're supporting your local uh, fly shop, um, uh, wherever that may be. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Orvis up in Dallas or San Antonio or, you know, Backwoods in Fort Worth or uh, um, Tailwaters or, uh, you know, Living Waters down in Round Rock, support those guys uh, and, and, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you're keeping them in business. Uh, 
and uh, th those folks will steer you in the right direction as far as gear and flies as well. Uh, white bass run gets crazy. It's you can see in this picture. There's it's it's nose to tail boats. A lot of folks, a lot of folks out there on the water. This gentleman right here has caught. Um, He's caught more fish, white bass in Central Texas. He's just a guru. Um, I've learned a lot from him. And these folks think they're white bass fishing and they think they're gonna catch fish. But once he gets his fly on right there, he's gonna promise he's probably gonna go school them. Um, learned a lot from him watching him over the years. Again, head to tail boat. Uh, these fish, these folks have a hole of fish corralled up over on this bank, and there are like four or five boats right there. Uh, I don't care to fish in situations like that. Maybe you do, but uh, I'd rather avoid that. So to close it out, just some shots over the years. A good friend of mine and passed away a few years ago. Bill Menifee was 94. Uh, he wasn't 94 in that photo, but he was upper 80s, and that's him on his kick boat on the Colorado Bend, and uh, just some other white bass springtime fly fishing shots. Good friend of mine there from our fly club, and there, there's uh, Bill Menifee, and took him out one time, and he's using an eight-weight rod, but he had had a lot of fun. Caught a lot of fly, uh, caught a lot of fish that day. So it's it's just pretty scenery. It's fun to get out, uh, young or old, uh, you catch fish, and uh, they're great fly rod fish. Uh, pretty in their own way. Got a beautiful golden eye on them. And uh, again, you don't need fancy gear if you like to eat fish. Take the fillets, season them up however you like. Chunk them on some foil on a grill and make fish tacos. And that's about all I've got. Uh, and if y'all have any questions, you can uh, email me at the email address below and I'll do my best to, to help answer, uh, answer them for you. But uh, my uh, my laptop said it's about to die over here, Kira. So if it uh, if we're just questions and I go off the air suddenly, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I'll take any questions. Just one more question, really. They we you've kept up. Uh, somebody asked, light sky, light colored fly. How do you go with with fly color or just match the fish? Well, great great question. I usually. <laughs> Well, I will follow up with an email about what Pat usually does. Um, and if you need his email, it is uh, CC'd in the email that I sent you for registration. So you are welcome to uh, send him an email of thanks and tell him how you appreciated the, uh, the uh, presentation. He did a really great job and we were so glad that he was willing to do this for us. If anyone, uh, has any other questions, uh, just get back with me or Pat, and we appreciate you. We'll, it'll take us a little while because with everything that uh, we're required to do, we're going to have to uh, edit the transcript. And so it'll be at least a week, a little bit longer maybe, and then we will send out the link so that you can watch this again online um, and see the recording. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much, everybody. We appreciate you. You have a great night.